Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and author of the newly released book, The Seven Laws of Abundant Living, Lessons Learned from the Tree of Life. Visit ignitinganation.com, scroll to the bottom of the page, put in your email address, and it'll take you to a link, and you'll be able to read the forward and the first chapter of the book. Everyone who has read the first chapter has ordered the book. Seven Lessons from the Tree of Life, broken down to seven lessons within each one of those seven points, giving you 49 specific calls to action from God who took us from the Tree of Life in the Garden of Eden to the Tree of Life planted right there by the River of Life. Get yourself a copy today, ignitinganation.com. Today we have the privilege of meeting with Mark Taylor, co-author of the book, The Trump Prophecies, the astonishing true story of the man who saw tomorrow and what he says is coming next. Mark Taylor is a former firefighter from Florida who's often presented as a Christian prophet based on the claim that God revealed to him in 2011 that Trump would become president. He has a new book out, The Trump Prophecies, The Astonishing True Story of the Man Who Says Tomorrow and What He Says is Coming Next, advancing the belief that Trump is a divine instrument. The Spirit of God says, I've chosen this man, Donald Trump, for such a time as this. Taylor said when he first prophesied about Trump, comparing him to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and describing Israel and America as allies in a great spiritual battle. Uh, this is an incredible story, and Mark Taylor, welcome to Revealing the Truth. Oh, thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. Mark, uh, you are a former firefighter, retired. Correct. You served a uh, distinguished career in serving a uh, local community uh, as a firefighter. So this idea, this concept of uh, prophecy, uh, prophet, um, prophesying, um, visions, those kind of things, was this something natural to you? Did you grow up? in a faith-based home, or was this something kind of brand new to you? No, I, I retired in 2006, but I got saved uh, when I was eight years old. Uh, my grandfather on my dad's side was a Baptist minister uh, at the time, and his my great-grandfather, his dad, was a Baptist minister who spread the gospel on foot up in the uh, Appalachians. Uh, so I, I have a it's in my bloodline on one side of my family, so to speak, but I'm not called to be a pastor, uh, and I'm called to the prophetic. Um, I don't have the uh, patience to be a pastor, if you know what I mean. So, uh, but uh, I got saved when I was eight years old. So uh, I have grown up in a faith-based home uh, pretty much my whole life. Yes. Was there any time during your firefighting career that you were there at the fire station and God gave you a vision of some child caught in a room or some event, or did you ever get to? Uh, uh, the scene of a fire and have an inclination, unction, a quickening, uh, a revelation that something was where it might not have been discovered? You know, I had, I guess, you know, when you have a prophetic gift that God gives you, you know, you're born with it, period. You, you know, just God puts it in you before you're ever born. And um, I can't say that I ever had a vision when I was on the fire department because I didn't. Uh, but what I will say is that you have these unctions or premonitions, some people call it, whatever word you want to use, uh, that something was about to happen, so to speak, and you would know it beforehand. Uh, I would be in a fire, uh, fighting fire at times, and I would have this premonition that something was about to happen, something bad. I'd get my guys out of harm's way or whatever the case may be. Um, those are the types of things that would happen. Um, I could be at a cutting or a shooting or a stabbing in a crowd of people and realize that something was about to take place. Uh, you know, those types of things. So I think God had been working on my prophetic gift my whole life, but just in a little bit different avenue, if you will, than what most people are used to. You know, the, there's a reason I'm asking you this question. And the reason is, is that there are those who are inclined to sensationalize and supernaturalize uh, a lot of things and throw them into the area of the occult or uh, put them in the area of, quote unquote premonitions, or um, in the Bible, they were called hosers, seers, 
people who can right. see things unfold. This right. is not who you are and not who you claim to be. I, I don't call myself a prophet. Okay, others call me that. There's nothing I can do to stop that. Um, but I mean, I am called to the prophetic. Um, I was, uh, I had a dream one time where I had Bobby Connor came to me, and he laid hands on me, and looked at me and said, "You are a seer." Uh, he said that uh, whatever you see your spirit do, you do also, basically. And he laid his hands on me, and all of a sudden I started seeing these white lights everywhere. And when I woke up uh, in in the natural, I was still seeing the white lights in my room around me. So I knew there was an impartation that took place at that point. Um, so uh, I know there are different types of prophetic people, so to speak, in the Bible. Uh, seers are one of them. Um, you know, uh, so, I mean, that's where, where God has called me to be, basically. Well, that's very interesting because the, the, the significant ones that we know about, uh, Joseph was a dreamer, but Asaph right. was a seer. Mm -hmm. uh, Daniel... Uh, assigned as a prophet by Christians, but as a seer by the Jews. And John at Patmos is given the attribute of a Hosea seer. Uh, he doesn't go from being the apostle John to the prophet John. He is given a vision of, of uh, what, is, what was and what is and what is to come and therefore is now given the gift of being a seer. Uh, it, is, it is one of the prophetic uh, gifts, but uh, the difference is, is that the words associated, uh, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, write this down and tell the people this. That's kind of the pattern for the quote-unquote office of the prophet, the one who is the direct messenger of God, um, uh, a very kind of specific role in this realm, but you're being used of God. Yes, yes. And I, I think if I, maybe I can, it'll help explain it this way. Uh, when I, when I uh, retired in 2006, or right, two years before I retired in 2006, I started getting sick. Uh, and I started getting anxiety, depression a little bit, mostly depression. And I retired in 2006. I started going to an apostolic church at the time uh, that, that flowed into gifts. And um, about a month after I retired in 2006, I had a visitation from the Lord. And uh, I went to bed uh, about 11 o'clock at night. Uh, my wife couldn't sleep. And she came to bed about 1 o'clock in the morning. And you know how you kind of roll over and mumble something to your wife? Hey, what are you doing coming to bed so late? And uh, she, she said, well, I couldn't sleep. Well, I rolled over and immediately, I mean, just like that, I was just, I was caught up in a vision. And I, I know people throw the word vision around a whole lot. Now, I've been to John Paul Jackson's satellite ministries, been through his dream interpretation schools, and there's a difference between dreams and visions. And this was a vision, a vision you don't forget. It's like etched on the hard drive of your spirit. And it's more real than what we are right now. And so I immediately was caught up in a vision. And I was in my bedroom, and I saw myself on the floor on my knees speaking in tongues and I was with this finger on my right hand mm -hmm. I was writing in cursive in the carpet and I looked in and all of a sudden I saw myself from so, I went from seeing myself to all of a sudden I am myself now which means two different things I looked in front of me and I saw a cloud and it was the most powerful ominous looking cloud you could ever imagine and I knew it was God and as I'm sitting there speaking in tongues, I'm continuing to write in the floor in cursive. And I looked to my left, and through the bedroom door, came around behind me, and stood to my right was another cloud. So as I'm sitting there writing in the cursive, or writing in cursive in the carpet, I see light coming out of this finger and out of this hand. And I cannot describe to you, brother, the amount of fear that I felt mm -hmm. at the time. It literally felt like God could have vaporized me from existence right there. And I know God only gave me about that much is all he gave me. And now at the time, I was not certified in dream interpretation at the time. So after that, I, I woke up and I was in the fetal position, literally in the fetal position. And I was it, what seemed like 15 minutes. Now, I went to bed at one o'clock, what seemed like 15 minutes. I woke up and when I woke up, I looked I couldn't wake open my eyes for like 15 minutes because I, that fear was still on me. I couldn't 
shake it. I was afraid of what I was going to see. And when I opened my eyes, the clock said 133. And I rolled over. I looked at my wife and I said, hey, I think I just had a vision. And she said, even my voice was different. Because, you know, it talked about when Moses was before the Lord, he had to veil his face. And it was like my voice was different, she said. And so I took it immediately to uh, a, a certified dream interpreter that been through John Paul Jackson's ministry. And he said, Mark, he said, you had a visitation from the Lord. He said, that cloud in front of you was God. The cloud that came in and stood behind you to your right is an angel that's been assigned to you. He says, the Bible talks about when we speak in uh, tongues, we speak mysteries. So he says, whatever it is that you're going to do, you were speaking it right there, but it was in mysteries. And he says, the light that was coming out of this finger and out of this hand is the anointing that God has given you to, to write something. Whatever it is that you're going to write, because you wrote it in the carpet, it will affect your walk and the walks of others. He said, that fear you felt was the actual spirit of the fear of the Lord that was upon you. Now, it took me probably five years before I figured out what the 133 was on the clock, because, you know, a lot of times you can add those numbers together. It means something. It could be scripture. And finally, it wasn't until I was listening to Kim Clement's teaching on the 12 tribes of Israel that I got the answer. And it was numbers 133, that I was of the tribe of Ephraim. And that's what that meant. So uh, that's how all of this kind of came about. So I knew that God was calling me that, uh, and I operate totally different than a lot of most prophetic people do. And I can explain that and go into detail on that and here in a little bit if you want. But this is something that was, it was just totally different um, in the way. And that kind of set the course for me after that because it was like four months, five months after that, I got deathly sick. I went downhill, totally downhill. I crashed. And I went to doctor after doctor. They couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. This went on for four and five years. Anxiety, depression. I was bedridden for four and five days at a time. I couldn't eat for four and five days at a time. Um, I was literally dying. I didn't even know it. Uh, I finally found a Christian doctor who knew what he was doing. And I had an extremely low thyroid. I had severe adrenal burnout from the fire service because the station I was at for many years, we turned 12,000 calls a year out of that one station alone. I had the hormones of a 70-year-old, and I had Lyme's disease mm -hmm. on top of that. So I was, I mean, I was sick. When I tell you I was sick, I was sick. So God had me isolated in my house literally with no friends. I couldn't do anything for 10 years before this Trump prophecy ever went public. Uh, so that kind of sets the stage as to what I went through and what God was doing, and it was a death to self. You know, a lot of people, one lady wrote in to me, and I like the way she put it. She says, Mark, she says, as a firefighter, you were a man's man, but God was turning you into his man. And there was a lot of things that had, I had to break off and to deal with, you know, uh, some of these walls that I had built as a firefighter, as a protection mechanism, had to come down because God couldn't use me until I had that compassion, so to speak, that I kind of lost on the street that was a protection mechanism for me. So that's, that's basically how it came about in a nutshell. In being a firefighter, your training... <laughs> is uh, looking past the danger al almost I mean, you, you respect the danger but you have to be willing to look past the danger right. of uh, walking through a, a, a burning crumbling building correct okay. you, you, you're looking in the face of, of life-threatening situations or fear but you overcome that fear in order to affect a rescue because what matters is the love of that person that's in that bad position that you're going in to try to save. How does one know, and that's a, that's a combination, a gift of compassion, uh, that's, that's a true servant's heart. How, how do you get past the fear? You know, I, there were there were times when, you know, you may have a little bit of fear, but I used to tell my guys, you know, it's not time to get nervous. When you see me get nervous, then it's time to get nervous, you know, until that point. Uh, you know, it's one of those things where you may get a little bit nervous in some of these situations, but I myself always felt protected. I always felt like God had my back, period. And, uh, you know, I, I pushed some things to the limit. I admit it, uh, you know, in a fire service where I probably shouldn't have pushed it. Um you know, but God always had my back, you know, whether it was in a crowd of, you know, a uh, quarter of a million people like uh, in downtown Orlando, we'd have these crowds, uh, these parties, block parties they would have. Uh, it would be in a cutting or shooting situation uh, where we'd have almost riot situations. I always felt protected. 
Uh, and God did. He protected me through all of that, uh, through 20 years worth of that. I'm strong in my faith. But even today, uh, 22 years after I've accepted the Lord, uh, I still assess dangerous situations. I'm not a, a, a fan of roller coasters or snakes. or uh, I could give you a list of things that, that right. uh, my faith should be sustaining and uh, I have the authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and overcome all the power of the enemy. But I don't play with them and I don't like them and I don't want to be around them just because I have authority right. over them. I have authority over them, but what if they don't respect that authority? What if they don't know that I have that authority? What if, you know, that's a, that's that. that well, that. I, I think it, it's based on, you know, we all have our fears. Uh, but it's, it's like if I go into a, if, let's say if, if I pull up to a situation right now at a gas station or whatever, and I see something going on, somebody's hurt, somebody's been shot or stabbed, uh, you know, yes, I'm going to assess the situation before I go running into it, but am I going to help that, that person or a car wreck I may come across, uh, you know, or if I come across a house fire right now, I mean, I would be going in like I am right now to try to affect a rescue. Um, but now I've been trained, so it's a little bit different. Right. I know what to look for, but it's what you do in the face of that fear. That counts. The, the, the reason I'm asking these questions is because I want to just establish clearly. I'm talking to a firefighter, retired, who went through a debilitating 10-year illness of struggling with human condition, human circumstance. Uh, you're isolated enough as a fireman where you have this brotherhood, but outside the brotherhood there was not uh, close friendships because of your schedule, because of other things. You could be uh, the, the neighborhood barbecue. You get to call. You go. Difficult on your family, difficult on you. Uh, and here it is now a time when you have 10 years alone, isolated uh did you find in that isolated period a devotion to seeking a deeper relationship with the lord or were you truly struggling with the sickness and the debilitation of your condition actually it was both uh there were there were times when honestly i was so sick i couldn't even read because nothing would go in um there would be times when uh i maybe have to just listen to something uh, or, you know, listen to something on, on TV, uh, or something like that in order to get fed. Uh, I was too sick to even go to church. Um, so, I mean, there were times when, um, you know, I live in the middle of nowhere and, uh, I, I would, my, my, my mom and dad used to live on property next to me and I'd build a fire over there or they would, and I would just go by, sit by the fire and I would just have that quality time with God by myself, you know, sitting around, whatever the case may be. Um, I, I think that's one of the things that, um, and again, I, I operate a little bit differently than most people that I think people miss out on is that meditating on God, uh, listening for the voice of God. But it's like, because people ask all the time, well, how do you hear the voice of God? Well, I don't just hear the voice of God. I've learned to hone my spiritual senses. You have five spiritual senses like you have in the natural. I see the voice of God. I smell the voice of God. I taste the voice of God. You know, the Bible says, taste and see that I'm good. Um, you know, whatever the case may be. I'm constantly, everywhere I go, I'm looking for the voice of God. I'm listening. I'm, I'm smelling, whatever the case. I mean, God will speak through nature to me. I, I, I go on walks with my dogs here because I live in the middle of nowhere. I'm constantly meditating on the Lord and what he's trying to say. Um, and I think that's where a lot of people miss the mark sometimes is they're not looking for it all the time. They're not listening for it all the time. You, you know what I mean? They're not smelling for it all the time. So uh, this, these are one of the things that, that, again, I operate a little bit differently than most people. Do you see this in hindsight as your Joseph, Elijah, and Moses experience? Uh, are you, what are you talking about? You're, 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 t you're 10 years of being set apart. Oh, yeah, yes, yes. Uh, you know, uh, yes. 
honestly, I, you know, God had me isolated for a reason. All my friends had abandoned me pretty much. I only heard from them like once every six months, you know, Hey, how you doing? This type of thing. Um, you know, I, I see it as, again, it was a breaking down of self dying to self and becoming what God wanted me to become. Um, so, I mean, it's just one of those things that, um, helped me in my process to get me where I'm at right now. I'm not saying I'm where I need to be because we're all on this journey together and it's all, all right. always a process. We've got three min three minutes till we go to break. I want mm -hmm. you to st uh, April 28th, 2011 is the day you released the full text of your prophecy. Right. I want you to take me for April of 2010 to April of 2000, right up to the point of the prophecy, because I'm going to open the second segment reading this prophecy and then talking to you about it. I want okay. the stage to be set so that we know your mind, your, your frame of mind, your physical uh, well-being, what you're thinking of, what your mind is on, for you to be in a position to have, first of all, to receive this word and then be released to give this word and to understand the difference between the two. Okay, so I had had four years of basically being isolated at that point. I had had uh, probably, I think I, at the time I wrote the prophecy, I just found that doctor, the first doctor. But before that, in 2010, I was bedridden for four and five days at a time. I couldn't eat for four and five days at a time. I lost all kinds of weight. I was down to almost my high school weight at the time. Uh, I mean, um, I didn't have, I lost muscle tone. I mean, so, I mean, you're talking about being isolated and it was so, talk about a battle of the mind, if you will. This was probably the biggest battle I've ever had because trying to overcome these circumstances in my mind that this, this stuff's never going to go away. You know what I mean? Maybe I'm going to be like this for the rest of my life. You know, how is God ever going to use me in this condition? Um, you know, I I'm battling all these things and then not having the energy to even go to work, you know, because my wife had to go back to work full time. I couldn't. Um, so, I mean, uh, so I'm just re re requesting or picking up on a retirement check. But, I mean, I couldn't do work around here. At, there, at some point, I had to hire some guys to mow my place. Uh, so I, there was a lot of things, you know, as a man, you want to provide for your wife, uh, you, you, you want to be able to make a life for yourself. And I couldn't do any of this stuff because of the condition that I was in at the time. And so leading up to this, if someone would have ever told me that I would be writing the Trump prophecy in 2011 and sitting here on an interview with you right now, I would have said there is no way because my mind and my condition at the time was so bad. Yeah, I was in survival mode. Literally, I was in survival mode at that point because I didn't know if I was going to die or not. And come to find out, the first doctor I went to said that my numbers were so bad, I was within six to eight months of checking out. Up until this point, what did you know about the name Donald Trump or had you even heard it before? Yeah, I've heard of Donald Trump before. Um, you know, I knew he was just a very powerful businessman who built this multi-billion dollar empire um, and I mean, I just knew he was just a great businessman. That's all I ever knew about Donald Trump, pretty much. Okay. All right. We're talking with Mark Taylor, co-author with Mary Colbert, uh, of the Trump prophecies, the astonishing true story of the man who saw it tomorrow and what he says is coming next. Going back to April 28th, 2011, when we return from break, I'm going to read to you the full text of Mark Taylor's April 28th, 2011, mark that date in your mind, 2011, hey, Donald Trump is not on the scene in any presidential conversation whatsoever at the time that this prophecy was given to Mark Taylor. We'll be right back. Back. Shalom. I'm the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, Executive Director of Ignatic Nation and host of the daily TV program Revealing the Truth seen live every Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Central Standard Time at www.ianbn.com and then replayed throughout the day and night via our website. All of our segments can be seen on the Igniting Nation YouTube channel. Since our launch in January of this year, we've expanded our global reach to over 54 countries with a social media following of over 125,000. Our commitment is to bring you the most in-depth interviews with authors, 
subject matter experts, and thought leaders from around the world. We have interviewed guests from Israel, Brazil, England, India, and all across North America. All of our authors are featured on the Books and Media page on our website, www.ianbn.com. There you can find a direct link to the book you want to order, and we receive a small commission directly from Amazon. There is no cost to you for this service. In addition to our daily teachings and interviews, we make available to you the archive of all of the interviews on our YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram channels. Our live program is available from our homepage, and there is never a charge to you for any of this access. We made the decision long ago that we would remain a commercial-free resource that would not be influenced by any pressure from any outside company. There are only two ways that we are able to continue to operate this ministry and provide you with the only live, four-hour daily Christian television talk show program. The first is through your support and tax-deductible contributions to Igniting a Nation. These can be made directly through the donate button on the website or sent through the mail to Igniting a Nation, 2700 Corporate Drive, Suite 120, Birmingham, Alabama, 35242. The other way we support the program is by offering you a unique opportunity to have access to over 10 years worth of teachings on a subscription basis. The teaching archives contains all of my prior sermons, Torah studies, prophecy in the news videos, and much more for the low subscription price of $5 per month. This subscription grants you unlimited access to over 800 hours of content not available elsewhere and is updated weekly with the most current prophecy classes. In addition to 20 hours of original TV programming each weekday, we invite you to join us live every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday evenings for our Prophecy in the News classes. The times and locations are listed on our events page on the website www. Dot I-A-N-B-N dot com. Every day you and I are faced with the challenge of where we will go to hear the truth. We are committed to bring you the only program of its kind that covers the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. We cannot do this without your support. Since we launched on January 5, 2017, we have aired over 300 individual teachings, interviews, and commentaries not available anywhere else. We are now working side by side with almost every major Christian publishing house to bring you the most in-depth feature interviews possible. Our one-hour features address every subject that affects the believer's life. We are hearing of salvations from the Middle East, Africa, and all across the United States. Lives are being changed every day, and we have only just begun. Our mission is to become your trusted resource and grant you access to the people, tools, and information you need to grow in your relationship with the Lord. You can help us by liking us on social media and through your financial support. We know you have many choices in who you support, but we are prayerfully asking you to consider helping us keep revealing the truth, true to our calling, to cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth like no other program available. Donate today and help us bring the message to the four corners of the earth. Visit www.ianbn.com and donate, buy a book, or subscribe to our teaching archives. Without you, we do not exist. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with Mark Taylor, co-author of The Trump Prophecies, The Astonishing True story of the man who saw tomorrow and what he says is coming next. Mark Taylor, welcome back to Revealing the Truth. Thank you for having me. Mark, you've taken us all the way up to the time in which you've uh, endured 10 years of uh, debilitating uh, illness to the point of bringing you truly within a year's, uh, had it been untreated, a year's uh, uh, ending your life and uh, you're a young man. Okay. Uh, what were you doing? What were you thinking? What was going on when the stage was being set for you to receive on April the 28th this stunning word from God? 
Well, I had still been sick uh, for a long time, and uh, it was one of those nights, basically, that uh, you know I was there fighting that the battle of the mind, basically. You know, is this stuff ever going to end? Uh, you know, sick to my stomach. Uh, you know, just in agony, basically. And uh, I was sitting in front of the TV, and I was watching. I think it was Fox News or something like that. And I saw Donald Trump in an interview, and. All of a sudden, as I'm listening to, to Donald Trump, because at the time he was toying about running in 2012, he, he didn't he didn't announce he was running. He was just toying with the idea, and everybody was saying it was a joke, you know, this, that, and the other. And so he never announced he was running. So I'm listening in this interview, and all of a sudden, because I was sitting in the living room, and I and I heard the voice voice of the Lord say, "You're hearing the voice of a president." So I got up and I came in here where I'm at right now, which is a, a bedroom I converted into an office. I sat down, I put pen to paper, just like the Apostle Paul. And I started writing out what the Holy Spirit was telling me. And that was April 28, 2011. And it was called, I titled it Commander-in-Chief. And it says, the Spirit of God says, I have chosen this man, Donald Trump, for such a time as this. For as Benjamin Netanyahu is to Israel, so shall this man be to the United States of America. For I will use this man to bring honor, respect, and restoration to America. America will be respected once again as the most powerful and prosperous nation on earth other than Israel. The dollar will be the strongest it has ever been in the history of the United States and will once again be the currency by which all others are judged. The Spirit of God says the enemy will quake and shake and fear this man I have anointed. They will even quake and shake when he announces he is running for president. It will be like the shot heard across the world. The enemy will say, what shall we do now? This man knows all our tricks and schemes. We have been robbing America for decades. What shall we do to stop this? The Spirit says, ha, no one shall stop this that I have started. For the enemy has stolen from America for decades, and it stops now. For I will use this man to reap the harvest that the United States has sown for, and plunder from the enemy what he has stolen, and return it sevenfold back to the United States. The enemy will say, Israel, Israel, what about Israel? For Israel will be protected by America once again. The Spirit says, yes, America will once again stand hand in hand with Israel, and the two shall be as one. For the ties between Israel and America will be stronger than ever, and Israel will flourish like never before. The Spirit of God says, I will protect America and Israel, for this next president will be a man of his word. When he speaks, the world will listen and know that there is something greater in him than all the others before him. This man's word is his bond, and the world and America will know this, and the enemy will fear this, for this man will be fearless. The Spirit says, when the financial harvest begins, so shall it parallel in the spiritual for America. The Spirit of God says, in this next election, they will spend billions to keep this president in. It will be like flushing their money down the toilet. Let them waste their money, for it comes from and is being used by evil forces at work. But they will not succeed. For this next election will be a clean sweep for the man I have chosen. They will say things about this man, the enemy, but it will not affect him. They shall say it rolls off of him like the duck. For as the feathers of a duck protect it, so shall my feathers protect this next president. Even mainstream media will be captivated by this man and the abilities I have gifted him with. And they will even begin to agree with him says the Spirit of God. Wow. Wow. They will spend billions to keep this president out. Yes. We're still talking about a year into his presidency, the billions that were poured out, and right. how they tried to keep him out of office. So right. you give this word April 28, 2011. When does Donald Trump officially announce his candidacy? I think it was June 15, 2015, I believe. Okay, so a little bit more than four years prior to you have made this declaration, this proclamation, this prophecy. When did you begin to share it? I did not share it until, uh, I want to say... The beginning of 2015, I shared it with uh, Dr. Colbert at the time. Uh, I had walked into his office for a yearly checkup or whatever it was, and I handed him a folder. I had a couple of prophecies in it because at the time I didn't have a platform. I just knew that, that they were good Christian people. And I just wanted to run it by him. I said, hey, uh, this is what I wrote in 2011. Uh, I said I, I handed him a folder first off, and he set the folder aside, and he started checking me out, and then he started prophesying over me. And he says, Mark, I feel like the Spirit of God's saying that you're going to wake up. God's going to start downloading some words to you, and you're going to begin to write these prophetic words out. I said, well, it's already started, Doc. I said, that's what's in that folder I just handed you. And we kind of laughed, and he says, you mean that folder you handed me? And I said, yeah. He said, I thought those were signs and symptoms you were handing me. 
I said, no, those are prophecies. So he read the one uh, I, that I just read, Commander in Chief, and he says, look, I, I want to share this with Mary because uh, his wife, because you know I think she wants would want to hear this. So he shared it with Mary, and that's where the story kind of took off. She started. Uh, she said she recognized the rhythm of God in it, and she started handing it out to big leaders, you know, across the nation, and this, that, and the other. So it doesn't stop here. No, that what you just said a second ago, and when it says this next election, they will spend uh, billions to keep this president in. You know, it, it, it alludes to the fact and um, uh, that he would run for a third term. I wrote a prophecy saying that he would try for three. Uh, later on in that it's in the in the book I believe and a lot of people gig me on that and they said oh he can't do that because it's un uh, unconstitutional and you know this that and the other and this is what I tell people about the prophetic you better be very very careful how you treat the prophetic because the prophetic is mysteries they are mysteries and the Bible says to search a matter out and people are so quick to jump to conclusions as to what they think it means and when in fact we don't know truly what it means. Even me, when I write something, I don't even know what it means sometimes. I just know God's speaking through me, and I don't even realize what it is to the degree until it comes to pass. Well, when I wrote that prophecy that he would seek a third term, we're seeing that come to pass now because he's got an office two miles from the White House. He's got a shadow government, and he's trying to undermine President Trump and everything that he does. Now we're seeing the third term truly take place. Uh, so uh, it's stuff like that that people have to be careful with. So in this where they said they will spend billions to keep this president in, well, that was kind of his agenda because they spent – how many billions did they, s they spend to keep – to get Hillary in? How many billions did they spend to keep Donald Trump out? And Hillary Clinton was already deemed that it would be a, you know, an Obama third term anyway. So – In a uh, November 7th interview you did with Right Wing Watch – it says, Mark Taylor, the firefighter prophet and right-wing conspiracy theorist who claims that God told him that Donald Trump would become president years ago, appeared on Greg Hunter's USA Watchdog, where he revealed that God told him that two of the five former presidents will soon die and the other three will face jail time as divine retribution for criticizing President Trump. I never did an interview with Right Wing Watch. Uh, they're, they're probably commenting on the fact that what I did with Greg Hunter. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's what they're doing. Um, no, I did an interview where I, I wrote a prophetic word called the evil crew of 32. And, uh, it talks about the five ex presidents where God's going to remove two of them from the face of the earth, basically as signs. And the other three, uh, Obama would do jail time. Basically, uh, Clinton would probably do jail time and then Bush would be very close. So they're, they're taking my words and kind of spinning that a little bit. Well, but we do see that there is a uh, a great conspiracy going on. Is it your position um, uh, prophetically that uh, what is the outcome going to be of this Mueller investigation? Will Hillary face a prosecution for the Clinton Foundation, for the Uranium One deal? Will Bill Clinton finally be held accountable as so many others are being held accountable. Um, yes. What What is God saying to you in regards to this, uh, uh, what, what uh, your publishing company, Defender, is standing behind uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Bob Guinness, right. uh, behind Carl Gallops, behind uh, Josh Peck, behind those they're saying, there's a shaking coming. Well, there's a shaking coming. It's already started. Uh, I wrote uh, a prophetic word called Don't Be Deceived, Get in the Fight. That was October 13th, 2015, and it addresses the Clintons. And it talks about uh, your time has come to an end. You're both being omitted for the crimes you have committed. Hillary's is no great secret, but they and they will be her downfall, but bills will be exposed one after the other, and it will be a windfall. For this time, you will not escape prosecution and restitution for the rape and prostitution. You thought no one saw, but I, the Lord, see it all. Now this will be your downfall. And it talks about how this sitting president at the time, Obama, basically uh, would um, – he, he's spreading division and corruption and that he would be held accountable as well. He was going to go down and be ripped and stripped of the presidency. Now, a lot of people thought that was going to be impeached. I didn't think that's what that really meant. I thought that would be after he was out of office, God was going to strip him of the presidency because if he's charged with treason – 
that immediately becomes he becomes stripped of that title of the presidency. So uh, and he will be held accountable. And so I mean, so will Bill Clinton. So will Hillary. All these people. And uh, the other one that I wrote was a month about a month after that, uh, November seventeenth, two thousand and fifteen called Time is Up for Those Who Are Corrupt, and it's talking about all the senators, the congressmen and women, judges of all kinds at the local, state, and federal levels will be held accountable for this corruption. Time is up for those who are corrupt, and even the Supreme Court would not be immune to their backdoor deals that's been going on. So God is going to literally clean up all this darkness that's going on. They will be held accountable. What are we up to now? Close to between nine and 10,000 indictments right now, sealed indictments that I've heard. So you will see these people rounded up. You will see them held accountable. Gitmo was already told to expand. So they're getting ready right now. There's a reason why, too. Uh, you know, uh, Greg Hunter is a, a personal friend of mine, and he did a, a fantastic job on Donald Trump's executive order. He just signed December 21st, and he went in-depth as to what that actually meant. And uh, as far as um, confiscating assets uh, and monies, I've been saying all along, if you want to stop all of this right now, period, is arrest George Soros. You cannot just arrest him, but you have to confiscate his assets and his money. That would stop Antifa, Black Lives Matter, all these, all this money going to uh, uh, Barack Obama's so-called shadow government, the Clintons, all of this stuff would stop. There's your border wall money right there. He's got enough money to build a border wall on the northern and southern border. But the point being is that all this stuff is fixing to come to a head. Now, a, uh, about a month before Donald Trump got elected, I went on record and, uh, and, and uh, was saying, or the Lord started dealing with me about a month before he was elected, that there would be military-style tribunals coming for this corruption because this corruption, is the length, the depth, the width of this is so big, we've never seen anything like this in history. It would, And the Lord told me it will make Nuremberg look like a cakewalk, period. And uh, so you're going to see all this stuff take out. Now, I, d I went on record the day after he got uh, elected on another interview I did saying that there would be military style tribunals. And now you're starting to see some of this stuff begin to take place. So that brings into question two things. Okay? First of all, a clear delineation between what all of us who are conservative biblical worldview analysis are all in agreement on many of these issues. So how do we determine what you're saying from what we're in agreement on to prophecy? And do you have a position on uh, what's going to happen with Jeff Sessions? Uh, in order to have a Nuremberg, you've got to have a leader at the top who is going to drive for the most thorough trial in the history of mankind where the convictions rolled out uh, in, in the, it, even today, uh, the Nuremberg test, uh, anybody who was a part of the Hitler regime, uh, 89 years old, 98 years old, 102 years old, living in Dubuque, Iowa, if it's found out that you were a guard, you are going to be held and tried under the Nuremberg standards. Right. Um, prophetically, what is it that we're not seeing uh, as uh, conservative commentators, as uh, conservative biblical voices within the world? What is it we're not seeing that God is showing you that's going to unfold and are there names in play? It, does Jeff Sessions get taken out and does a, um, uh, a Trey Gowdy, who, right. who, who is a man who says, oh, these are just sparring. These may look like fighting gloves. Right. The, the, this, the, the, uh, these are just what I warm up in. These are what right. I keep. This is what, these are just what I use to keep my hands warm. Okay? Right. You have no, I I, no idea. I think the biggest thing is is that you know even uh, even Greg will tell you even as an investigative reporter because uh, we've had many conversations it's getting harder and harder to vet sources right now in this technological information age that we live in. So the, the one thing I will tell people: be careful who and what you listen to. Now, as far as Jeff Sessions is concerned, if he's not doing his job, I'm not too worried about it because God's going to remove him too. 
and he'll put the right person in. Uh, because now the other thing you have to remember, too, is that there is some ops going on, I believe, behind the scenes that are being made to look like certain things to put the enemy at ease when, in fact, the opposite is happening, if that makes sense. Because they don't want their enemy knowing what's happening. Donald Trump is a genius, literal genius. This guy is 10 steps ahead of everyone. He's not going to show his hand as to what he's doing. And this is where the public has to come about. And even the evangelicals, they've got to be praying to give this man the sevenfold spirit to understand and deal with the enemy, uh, how it needs to be done, and round these people up. You don't want your enemy knowing what you're doing ahead of time. So what's the most effective way? Put them at ease. So it looks like Jeff Sessions may not be doing anything when, in fact, he probably is. And he's probably on board. So it could be made to look like nothing's happening behind the scenes. So that's what I want to make people aware. Um, as far as the military-style tribunals, I know I have talked to Greg. He's got sources that have confirmed that some of this stuff is going to happen, uh, these tribunals. Now, here's the other thing I want to point out. I've got some military friends, and um, and I didn't even realize this. And, you know, they had called up 1,000 retired officers from the military. And uh, one of the friends of mine is an officer, and he said, basically, he says, you know, some of that stuff was for, supposed to be like for training the troops and this, that, and the other, getting them back up to where they needed to be, this, that, and the other. But he says, you know, the other thing that comes to mind here is that what if they're calling these guys back for the tribunals? Because it's officers that sit on those tribunals. Right. And he says, if they call me, he says, I would do it in a heartbeat. So that's, those are the things that we have to be looking at. You know, they're not, we're not going to be told what's going on right now. So prophetically, though, um, and certainly these are things we can talk about um, my sources in Washington, my right. sources in the right. Middle East, uh, we, we all have our sources. Um, when I published my book two years ago on the weaponization of DNA, um, it was a blockbuster, wh what do you mean you can weaponize DNA, and gave right. its history and its intent. Uh, if you wipe out the Levitical line, which is now a Y chromosome to determine if you are one, then there is no Sanhedrin, there is no return of Jesus. If you want to know Satan's ultimate plan, it's to wipe out the Levitical line and he reigns forever. How do you do that? Right. You weaponize the DNA and people right. are going, this is unheard of, it's unconscionable. And every day they're licking that little package and sending it to 23andMe and I'm saying, listen, I don't want my DNA on anybody's database. I don't want my DNA in anywhere where you can figure out who I am and what I am because there's somebody out there who wants to get rid of me, and they can take right. that and figure out a virus or some venom that will just attack that particular strand. And I put it in the water system and only random people die and nobody looks into it. It's because they've weaponized DNA. Right. And right. it's logical, rational, reasonable, and there are at minimum 45 laboratories around the world working on weaponizing DNA for population control and for the elimination wow. of certain people groups. So, um, but you're the only one that I've talked to at this point that has actually uh, verified what I've been saying all along, that it's the goal of man to change, uh, to change their DNA, is right. to hand it over to the Luciferian bloodline, basically, so to speak. And it's like... Man, so it's like this is kind of a, a great year, honestly. <laughs> well, and th and, th and this was my uh, it, it was it was birthed out of a betrayal, and I took a sabbatical year, and I went and I talked to former NSA, CIA, right. uh, Mossad, FBI, intelligence workers who were willing to talk to me about what they found. Why did two hundred geneticists, when the Iron Curtain fell, relocate from Moscow? to Tehran. Okay. Why does Tehran have the largest genetics institute in the world? Why would you care about, right. about the genealogy, the, the Ancestry.com of, uh, of Persia? Uh, they're working on the weaponization of sure. DNA to, I mean, guess if they could find a DNA strand for Sunnis, do you not think that they wouldn't be developing some kind of weapon that would kill the Sunnis so that the Shiites could survive. 
I mean, you, right. you have to really wrap your mind around all right. of this. But my, my question to you from a prophetic standpoint, and we're talking about the prophecies, is what new revelation do you have prophetically that you're able to share with us, if any? And if not, then we know that there are certain logical things that are progressing that will, in time, go back to an Ezekiel, go back to an Isaiah, go back to a time of Daniel, go back and connect the dots. So my full faith and confidence is as prophecy is unfolding. My yes. question to you as a messenger is, is there a new message that God's given you that you're ready to release? Well, I, I don't have anything that I'm ready to release that I just released, like the, the evil crew of 32 uh, that I talked about here uh, is talking about uh, these corrupt leaders, basically. It doesn't matter if they're in politics. It doesn't matter if they're in the, the, the churches. Uh, you will see some disappear from the face of the earth. God's had it with the corrupt. Judgment starts in the house of the Lord. That's where it's at now. It's on the leadership of America. It's not on America. It's in the systems, basically, is what is under judgment right now. Um, anything new right now is going to be the energy. I'm working on another one right now that's going a little bit more in depth uh, on the energy independence, uh, basically, that the Lord showed me. Uh, worse. Yeah, right here, uh, December 16th, 2016, I wrote it called Energy, Energy, and that uh, America and uh, Israel would be energy independent. And basically what we're fixing to see, brother, is we are si fixing to see an energy explosion here and with Israel uh, like we've never seen in history. And they will both be energy independent. America will no longer be an import nation but an export nation. Now, here's the key. When I wrote that prophecy uh, December 16, 2016, uh, it says that you countries that have dominated energy for decades, you move your evil agenda and are charged with this guilt. Your days are numbered, and you will say, look how fast this was built. My America and my Israel will be one, and because of this, you will be undone. Because of the rage and the money you made from those countries you manipulated and attacked from within, you will now have to turn to those countries to, for help uh, on a whim. For your wells will go dry, and your finances too, for you will now be fed from the red, white, and blue. And what God is saying there is that these countries, these OPEC countries, that have been literally using money to terrorize Israel, terrorize America, using that money to, for terrorism, their wells are going to go dry, and their finances will also. And what astounded me is, is about two months after I wrote that prophecy, or after Donald Trump got in, he went to Saudi Arabia for the first time after he got inaugurated, and he did a huge arms deal. Nobody could figure out why they were doing the arms deal. Well, someone sent me a, a Fox News clip. Of they were saying the reason they were doing the arms deal is because Saudi Arabia's wells were about to go dry. My mouth hit the floor when I saw that. And what you're going to start seeing is that these Middle Eastern countries who have been terrorizing, using that money for corrupt ways, their wells are going to go dry. So America is going to go from an import nation to an export nation. So you're going to see a whole new dynamic here in America and Israel, period. Well, I'm uh, uh, encouraged that the contemporary word of God continues to come to you in relationship to America in Israel, which is really Israel is all that matters. Uh, that is the epicenter. That is what the Bible is about. That is about the Lord's return. And looking at it in that regards, America is doing the right things and the right man is in office to do so. Uh, I strongly encourage uh, those who have not read the Trump prophecies, the, the astonishing true story of the man who saw tomorrow and what he says is coming next, that you do reveal in here some clues as to what is to follow. And yes. so I uh, want to thank you for your candor, for your humility, and for your sharing the truth of the Trump prophecies. And what a great opportunity to meet you and uh, uh, hopefully we'll continue as you release more of the prophecies that God has given you that are formulated to the point of understanding that God is giving you words, but has not yet released you to combine them into the message. And this is the prophets, process of the prophet. Uh, so it's not that you're still not in a season of prophecy. You're in the gathering of the word in order to assemble the word 
and then be released to deliver the word that God has ordained. And I respect that tremendously in you, Mark, and I thank you for that. And thank you for being with us here on Revealing the Truth. Thank you, Mary. It's an honor to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And that brings to an end our broadcast day. Uh, however, that doesn't mean we go off the air. These broadcasts are broadcast 24 hours a day, seven days a week, so that we are live uh, in every time zone and broadcast in every time zone throughout the world, that every region of the world will hear this message and every other one of the messages delivered today on today's program. We hope you'll stay tuned all day and through the night and join us back here live in studio at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning for Revealing the Bible, followed by at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, and 12 o'clock, Revealing the Truth, our interview program. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and every other social media site that over 400,000 people are following us on now and expanding uh, by uh, literally hundreds and thousands every week as we have a commitment to bring you the truth. If you're in the local area, join us Mondays in Tuscaloosa, Tuesdays in Gardendale, and Thursdays in Vestavia. Come to some of our Passover Seders and follow us online on Facebook at Igniting a Nation. Go to our website, inbn.com, and catch all of these great interviews. And we hope to see you back here tomorrow, 9 a.m. Central Time, from our studios here in Birmingham, Alabama. Until we see you back here tomorrow, we bid you shalom.